Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to cryptographic services, cryptography, and key management in Domain 4 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the fifth of seven videos for Domain 4. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are just a minuscule part of our complete CCSP masterclass. All right, it's finding time for a seriously fun mind map video on cryptography. <laughs> no, seriously, cryptography is super cool and fascinating. It's amazing the number of services and capabilities that cryptography enables that we use every single day and probably don't even realize it. Want to store your data in a multi-tenant environment in the cloud where your data is commingled with other customers and still ensure your data is properly secured? cryptography? Are you using a CDN and replicating and caching large amounts of data across the planet but still want to ensure that your data has integrity? Cryptography can do that for you. Do you want to defensively destroy your data and render it unrecoverable? Crypto shredding has you covered. Cryptography is used pervasively in the cloud and it's an incredibly important tool in our security arsenal. So let's begin our whirlwind tour of cryptography by talking about the five major services that cryptography provides. First up is confidentiality, which allows us to make data available to only those who are authorized to view it. Confidentiality helps us to prevent unauthorized disclosure of information. Integrity ensures that information has been not been manipulated or changed by unauthorized individuals. Integrity helps us prevent unauthorized or unexpected changes to data. And to achieve integrity, we use hashing. So equate those two in your mind. Hashing equals integrity. Integrity equals hashing. Authenticity means we can confirm who something came from. We can, for instance, verify that a message came from a particular sender. Non-repudiation prevents someone from denying prior actions. There are two flavors of non-repudiation. Non-repudiation of origin means the sender cannot deny that they sent a specific message. They cannot deny the exact message or originated from them. And non-repudiation of delivery means the receiver cannot deny that they received a message. And finally, cryptography enables a form of access control. By controlling who we give cipher text to and who we give the decryption key to, we can control who can decrypt and therefore access some data. Cryptography is the study and application of securing information, generally through techniques like encryption, hashing, and digital signatures. Cryptography plays a huge role in the services of confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, non-repudiation, and access control. We use encryption for all of these, and we're going to start to we're going to go through how we can use digital signatures for integrity and authenticity and non-repudiation and how all these pieces work. There are two ways that we can go about scrambling the letters and turning plain text into ciphertext. One-way encryption and two-way encryption. One-way encryption means that we turn plain text into ciphertext, but then we can't go backwards in the other direction. We can't determine what plain text was from what ciphertext. Why would we ever do want to do such a thing? We use one-way encryption for integrity, essentially. And we typically call this hashing. Hashing uses one-way mathematical functions, which transform an arbitrary length input into a fixed length output, a fixed length message digest. Hashing algorithms need to be deterministic, which means that the same input will always result in the same output, the same digest. This is how we use hashing for integrity. If you hash the same file over and over and over again, you'll always get the same message digest, the same hash value. But if even a single bit in a massive file is changed, then the message digest, the hash value, will be completely different. By hashing a file at different times and comparing the hash values, you can easily see if a file has changed, which allows us, of course, to verify the integrity. Now let's talk about two-way encryption, which means we can encrypt some plain text with a key, turning it into ciphertext, and then as long as we have the right key, we can decrypt the ciphertext 
and turn it back into plain text. We can encrypt and then later decrypt. We can go in both directions, two-way. There are two major types of algorithms that we can use to perform two-way encryption, symmetric algorithms and asymmetric algorithms. The major difference between the two is the number of keys needed to encrypt and decrypt. Symmetric algorithms use just one key to encrypt and the same key to decrypt. Asymmetric algorithms use a key pair, two keys, one key to encrypt and the other to decrypt. More on asymmetric in just a bit here. Symmetric algorithms can be orders of magnitude faster than asymmetric algorithms. So whenever you need to encrypt lots of data and encrypt it quickly and efficiently, you need to use symmetric algorithms. So symmetric algorithms are relatively fast, efficient, and strong, but they have a major downside, key distribution. Symmetric cryptography uses the same key to encrypt and the same key to decrypt, which means that if you want to send some data securely, you need to encrypt it and send that ciphertext to someone and the key needed to decrypt it. I think you can see the problem here. Anyone could intercept the message and get the ciphertext and the key necessary to decrypt it. To solve this key distribution problem, you could send the key out of band, which is often not convenient or efficient. Or we can use hybrid cryptography, which means you use asymmetric cryptographic techniques to solve the symmetric key distribution problem. Let's venture into asymmetric algorithms now. The major seriously cool and useful characteristic of asymmetric algorithms is that they use a mathematically related key pair, two keys. We give the two keys in the key pair special names and treat them accordingly. We call one key the private key, which must be kept absolutely private and not shared with anyone ever under any circumstances ever. <laughs> and the other key in the key pair we call the public key and we can give it to anyone and everyone. Having this mathematically related key pair enables us to do some seriously useful things. Asymmetric cryptography solves some major issues related to symmetric cryptography. It allows us to securely distribute keys even when we don't have a pre-existing secure channel. It scales much better than symmetric out key encryption and it allows us to verify integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation when used as part of digital signatures. We can use asymmetric cryptography to securely and efficiently distribute symmetric keys, solving the key distribution problem. This is a very big deal. Not only that, but asymmetric cryptography also enables digital signatures, digital certificates, and the whole root of trust. Now, it's not all sunshine, rainbows, and butterflies with asymmetric cryptography. It has a major downside. It is slow, like really slow. It can be orders of magnitude slower than symmetric cryptography. So again, whenever we need to encrypt a lot of data and we need to encrypt it as fast as possible, we need to use symmetric cryptography. Moving on, digital signatures provide three major and very useful services, integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation. We create and use digital signatures in all sorts of different places sending emails and using digital signatures to verify the integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation of that email, of a message. Code signing so that we can verify that a software update we just downloaded for our phone actually came from, say, Apple or Google and wasn't modified in transit. Signing legal documents, such as PDFs, allowing others to verify who specifically signed the document. So there's a, these are just a few examples of what we can use digital signatures for. If someone digitally signs data, what this essentially allows us to do is to verify, to determine whether the data has been tampered with, whether it was truly sent by the person who claims to have sent it. And we can also prove whether an individual is responsible for the data. This means that digital signatures give us integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation. Now let's move on to digital certificates, which are issued by trusted organizations called certificate authorities. Digital certificates allow us to verify the owner of a public key. And when you get a certificate, the certificate authority will verify your identity and then digitally sign your certificate using their private key. Since everyone trusts the certificate authority, they trust that your public key is legitimate because it's been signed by the certificate authority. Digital certificates can be created by many different entities, many different certificate authorities. And so, we need a standard to make sure that all these certificates are interoperable. That standard is known as the X509 certificate standard. Let's now talk in more detail about 
keys and why are crypto variables and why we need to put so much focus and effort into key management. There's an expression I really like. The hardest part of security is cryptography and the hardest part of cryptography is key management. So why is key management so difficult but so critically important? Kirchhoff summed it up nicely in 1883 with his principle, a crypto system should be secure even if everything about the system except the key is public knowledge. An attacker can know the algorithm being used. The initialization vector can have access to the ciphertext. The attacker can, can know all of this and the information will remain secure so long as the key is kept secret. This obviously implies that we need to do a very good and very secure job of generating keys, distributing keys, storing keys, rotating keys, disposing of keys, and even recovering keys. So let's talk through these key management activities. Key generation or key creation is all about creating new symmetric or asymmetric keys. What is of critical importance is that each new key must be randomly selected out of the entire key space to avoid the plague of cryptography patterns. Key distribution is focused on securely transmitting shiny new keys to whoever may need them or and no one else, making sure no one else can intercept them. One method for key distribution is out of band. This involves distributing the key over a previously established secure channel, which could be as simple as securely exchanging it in person. Another option, and this is frankly what's much more pervasively used, is a hybrid model where we find our recipient's public key and use it to encrypt the symmetric key. Once the key has been encrypted, we can send it over to them even over an insecure channel. Once they receive it, they can use the private key to decrypt the symmetric key, which then enables them to communicate securely and efficiently with us via the symmetric key. This is exactly how TLS works, for instance. I will mention, of course, that another super method, common method of performing key distribution is to use algorithms that rely on asymmetric techniques, things like Diffie-Hellman and IKE, the Internet Key Exchange. All right, let's now move on to storage. For key storage, we often use TPMs, Trusted Platform Modules, or HSMs, Hardware Security Modules. A TPM is a type of crypto processor that generates and stores keys on endpoints such as laptops. An HSM, on the other hand, is a specific hardware device that is used at the organizational level to securely store and manage keys. HSMs are carefully hardened to keep them secure because of how valuable the keys are. So you can basically think of a TPM as being a little microchip installed into the motherboard, into the CPU of an endpoint device, whereas HSMs are big hardware devices that almost look like a server in a rack plugged into the network, and the HSM is storing encryption keys for the entire enterprise. Okay. Key rotation is the concept of changing keys on a periodic basis. If you practice key rotation and a set of keys is compromised, the attacker may only be able to access the data since the last rotation instead of all the data. Keys should be rotated as often as necessary. This is dependent on the value of the system, the value of the data, with higher value systems and data requiring keys to be changed more frequently. In the cloud, we generally dispose of our keys through the process of crypto shredding because we cannot physically destroy the cloud provider's hardware. So what is crypto shredding? It's a process of purging data by securely encrypting the data and then purging all copies of the keys, destroying every single copy of the key. We use crypto shredding quite commonly in the cloud because we generally can't destroy the cloud provider's hard drives, which is the best way of securely destroying data. We can even crypto shed keys to purge them. We simply encrypt our keys using another key and then purge all copies of this encryption key so that the encrypted key will no longer be accessible. So just remember crypto shredding is this idea that you encrypt some data with an excellent algorithm and then you destroy every single copy of the encryption key. Let's talk, now talk about key recovery. There are a few key recovery mechanisms that you can implement just in case you lose or accidentally destroy your keys. The first is split knowledge, which involves dividing a key up between multiple people. Under certain schemes, you may be able to recover the key, the complete key, even if one person is unavailable. So basically just remember split knowledge is splitting the knowledge of the, of the key up amongst two or more people. Dual control would be to keep secure copies of the keys in a safe 
that can only be accessed if two people unlock it at the same time. This keeps the backup keys in a little more secure location than if they were accessed by a single authorized person. And finally, we have key escrow, which involves storing keys with a trusted third party. If you lose access to your keys, you can get backup copies from the escrow service. And that is an overview of cryptographic services, cryptography, and key management for Domain 4, covering some of the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. Thank you.